Glad to have you all here this morning. Mm-hmm. What do you think, Mary? Will you watch the Super Bowl? <laughs> You're really looking forward to the halftime, probably, right? <laughs> How many people saw that Grammy <coughs> thing? Did you see it on the news? Did the anybody? What? The what? The Grammy Awards? No. No. Yeah, that, that famous satanic thing? Nobody saw that? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. So it was on the news all week. <coughs> Must be we both we watching some I saw good highlights from it. I didn't see anything satanic. Yeah, it was like yeah. cage and red. No. Oh, anyways. I saw the good highlights. Rev, thanks to church, the Sunday School, and Debbie's Raiders for the wonderful surprise party last Sunday. Thanks for the generous gift as well. And Debbie paid for it because now she's got a broken ankle, which really isn't connected with the party at all. But uh, if you all remember, some years ago she had broken her ankle getting in or out of the truck, and uh, it sounds like this is where the problem is she just got out of bed and couldn't put put pressure on her leg wow and they went and said well first they uh doc gave her some medicine sent her home then they were going to do some x-rays and then just the other late later on they found out it was broke oh my goodness so pray for Deb. She's going for some counseling, or not counseling, but counseling. Joe's going for the counseling. She's consultation. And when she consults, she'll be counseled too, probably. You know what? Yeah, I can. It's kind of funny in a way, I guess. But a few years ago, when Brandon was probably, I say he was 12 years old, and he went for a regular doctor's visit. And the doc said, uh, well, we didn't know anything. We got the bill. And it was, a part of the bill was like $137 for a psychological examination. And I says, what, what's, what, what is this? And I says, Brandon, did they give you a psychological examination? And he says, I don't think so. Yes, well, they asked me if I was happy and if I was thinking about killing myself. And that was the psychological examination. So I called the doc's office and I said, you know what? Uh, if I had any idea you were going to psychologically examine him, I wouldn't want you to do it, number one. And number two, um, this is ridiculous. Oh, so sorry. We usually don't do that. We usually ask first before we go ahead and do it. But it must have slipped through this time. We'll take it off your bill. So you know the moral of the story, right? Uh, you got to watch these things and you got to call because, boy, I'll tell you what, they can slide you through. They will and you will pay. You have to watch to see if your bill's estimated, too. Yeah. <laughs> So, an estimated. So they estimated? No, PPL. Oh, PPL estimated. Oh. <laughs> All right, so Sunday school follows morning worship. Ladies' meeting Friday at 1 o'clock. Ladies' meeting is this week, believe it or not. It used to be far off in the future. And uh, so it's as of, as of now scheduled for Friday. February is Food Pantry Month. We're doing pretty good back there. Todd Herb had his surgery this week and it went well. Art Wilson is recovering from his leg surgery. It's, again, it's a little bit slower and we have the same usual prayer requests. And John Brogland of the Mountaintop Church is Church of the Week. And uh, John is a really good guy. He's just, he's been at our conference about two years, maybe three, and he will be ordained this year, almost certainly. Uh, but he and his wife just adopted, uh, were they triplets? I think they're tri- three, three children, but I think they're triplets. And so 
Pray for John and his wife. <laughs> for more than one reason. <laughs> they think it's great right now. Yeah. No, they, they, they will be great parents. Jose and Pam Munoz of Guatemala and Bear Paraluck is our... Bill has uh, COVID right now. Oh, okay, I still COVID. And he's not answering the call, so I'm hearing maybe they put him in the hospital. <coughs> so yesterday I went to see Jean Bell, right? Yes. And all of you, know, if, you if you remember Jean, she was our choir director for many years, and <laughs> Sally Oakley's sister, Ed Reeves' aunt, and uh, Jean is always really uh, enthusiastic and cheerful, and uh, she was yesterday, her eyes are clear, and uh, she might have some, um, I guess she does have Alzheimer's, it's been documented, and so I said, Beth says, did she remember you? And I said, yeah, she says, because I, I said, Jean, you remember me? And she said, oh yes. You were always such a nice man. And Beth <laughs> says, oh, so then she didn't recognize you. You should be me, I'm telling you. Yeah, but you still enjoy them. <laughs> Beth does get off with a good one now. <laughs> Anybody else? With a prayer request, not a, not a joke. <laughs> Okay, how many eagles today? How many want the eagles? Sure. Why not? I want the puppy ball again. How many, yes, I know you're the puppy ball. How many eagles up here? Okay. And how many chiefs? None. Raise your hand high if you are an eagles hater. <laughs> okay, only two. I, I know there's... See that. I'm surprised there's so many Eagles haters around here. But uh, I still maintain that. I think they have the best uniforms, but I know somebody who thinks they have horrible uniforms. So, what are you going to do? No accounting for taste. Anybody else this morning? Carol. The earthquake. The earthquake victims in Turkey, Syria. I mean, Say that again, please. Earthquake. The earthquake, the workers, the country, the, the losses, the families left behind. Where was that? Turkey, Turkey and Syria. Turkey. Oh, Syria? Yeah, right. oh my gosh. Yeah. He just watches the Grammy news. I saw it in the news, and I did see it. Anybody else? Just imagine. When you were talking to Joanne Wilson, she mentioned that Jimmy Davis is in the uh, long term, the same room as Art. Jim Davis of uh, Lincoln Avenue. Lincoln Avenue. Yeah. And then um, Mr. Sullivan, the elementary principal, his mother is in the long term there now. She's had surgery on her foot and on her leg. So she's not in good shape either. She's in the long term also. Chris Lee Sullivan. Anybody else? All right. Great to have you all here today. Let's turn in our hymnals to number 35. Yeah, I couldn't see my picture. I believe it was good. <laughs> <laughs>
Negri, would you remain standing and turn to the inside? Right hand side of your boat. And if the lovely Mrs. Arthur would read the first line, <laughs> ladies will all read with her, and then we'll read the italicized. <laughs> you, you are a beautiful, holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on earth to be his people, his treasured possessions. It was not because you were more numerous that the Lord set his heart on you and chose you. You were, you were the fruits of all peoples. It was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath that he swore to your ancestors that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. No therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who maintains covenant loyalty with those who love him and keep his commandments. Thank you, baby. Let's follow and have a word of prayer. <coughs> Our gracious God, what a great passage of scripture we just read. We know that you chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob a long time ago. You gave them your, your word. You had no one greater to swear by. And you swore by yourself that they would have tremendous posterity they would have a land of their own to settle in one day, <coughs> and that for them, the whole world would be blessed. And in Christ Jesus, those things have all come to pass. But our Heavenly Father, we do have a place that we're headed, that is eternal in the heavens. We'll come down to this earth one day. We will be with Christ <coughs> for all eternity. You will be our light, and all our needs will be taken care of by the very presence of the living God. You've also promised us that, as the Apostle Paul said, the seed of Abraham, it's not a genetic thing. It's not a racial thing in terms of uh, a genealogy or a, a nationality or a locality, but it's those who share the faith of Abraham who are the true seed of Abraham. So our Heavenly Father, you have included us in your eternal kingdom and we are grateful forever. We will worship you for all eternity. Surely you're worthy. Our Heavenly Father, we're also grateful that you have revealed yourself to us as the God who hears prayer. In fact, when Jesus walked this earth, he told us we should quietly go into our prayer closet and make our requests known to the God who hears in secret. And you'll bring these things to pass. So our Father, we're coming before you here today publicly where two or more are gathered in your name, we know you're in our presence. You hear us in a special way. Uh, we pray for the earthquake victims in Turkey. And we pray, Father, that you would use this event and this experience to enlighten and to bring people close to you and to help us all to know and understand that the things of this world are transient. And uh, we deceive ourselves. The Apostle Peter said that we should not be surprised when difficulties and disappointments come into our life. That is the course of this world. That's why Christ had to come to set us free from this flawed world. We're thinking today of our friends and family who have physical ailments, and we ask you to reach your healing hand and touch them. We got friends and family on this list here, and those that are on that cafe prayer list each night. Our Heavenly Father, some of these things are just uh, so devastating and so consuming, and so uh, that they will just swallow up your life. We ask you to help our friends and family, that you would reach out and touch and bring healing, and we're grateful for however you do that. We also ask you that when we get to the place where we're gonna be called home, and those last days on this world are gonna be uh, quite an uphill climb 
Give us the patience and faith to know that you're doing the very best thing. We'll know it by fact, face to face one day. But down here we need faith, and we pray that you buoy our faith. We pray for our friends down in the mountaintop. We thank you for bringing John and Amy Broglin to us. And our Heavenly Father, the sincerity and the uh, integrity of these people, we are truly blessed to have them in our conference, and we ask you to continue to bless and use them down in mountaintop. We pray that men, women, and children might come to know you, and that as they expand their family, that you would walk them through that as well. We're praying tonight for this morning for Jose and Pam Munoz. We're so grateful for that long career of work they've done with the Utah Bond School and the way it has developed. And we thank you for the privilege, Lord, of being able to participate in that work. We ask you to continue to bless and use it. Our buddy Bill Harlock, we understand he's got COVID now, and so Father, uh, it just makes life so much more difficult and so much more uncomfortable. Well, we ask you to be with him and help him. Restore him to health, continue to strengthen him. We thank you that he's our friend. We ask your blessing on him and all our seniors. Father, we could pray all day. There's the United States Armed Forces, there's the uh, first responders, there's uh, law enforcement agencies, and everybody who shows up every single day to make this world a little bit more livable for the people around them. We thank you for each and every one. And we pray, Father, that we might be a part of that number and that we might see our time here on Earth as uh, not, not just as passing time, not just as waiting for the clock to run out, but as the opportunity to be the people you created us to be, and again, make somebody's life a little bit easier and a little bit better. Speak to us about that. Whatever line of work we're in, that's what we're doing, whether we know it or not. Lord, we can pray all day again and to be a worthy enterprise. We're gonna leave our prayers with ease. We're gonna ask you to hear our hearts as we open them up together and say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now we have the privilege of hearing the German Primitive Methodist Choir.
very much. That was beautiful. Always appreciate our choir. You know, again, we're going through the book of Deuteronomy, or at least uh, we just started it. And <clears throat> you'll see here in your bulletin today, it's not just a continuous scripture, but there's some definitions in there. And uh, at any rate, I'm going to read the scripture itself, and then we'll discuss all this. Let's have a word of prayer first. Father, thank you so much for this day and the blessings of it. And Lord, we thank you for your holy word. Because Lord, we're just regular people down here. We can figure things out and we can make our best estimate and we can put our heads together and get a lot of good ideas and maybe get some consensus or choose one out of the many and say this is by far the best we can come up with. And that's all great if that's all there is, but... Uh, there's so much more than that. Our Heavenly Father, we need your wisdom from heaven. We need your guidance from on high. We need to know your values and the things that you consider important. <coughs> and we need to change our will and our lives to conform with your will. And when we do that, we'll find joy and peace we will find strength and confidence and assurance and we will truly walk in the light. So Father, speak to us. We live in a world that desperately wants to conform the world to us. We want to make ourselves the center. We, even want, we want to conform you into our image. And we need the exact opposite. As a country, as a world, <coughs> as the human race, and as individuals. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Nation of Israel, about to enter the promised land. Moses has been told by God, I had a great walk with you, Moses, but you're not going into the promised land. Uh, it's just not for you. Now, Moses was a man, talk about a cut above. Again, the Lord said, you know, I speak to my prophets and I speak to them in visions and in dreams and through, you know, uh, revelations. But Moses, I speak to him face to face. And, uh, I mean, Moses, the whole world knows who he is. Everybody's heard of the Ten Commandments. Everybody's heard of the burning bush. Everybody's heard of Mount Sinai. Everybody's heard that the Red Sea was parted and Moses stood there and many, many people have heard about Moses and his staff that turned into a serpent and turned back to a staff and the ten plagues Moses called out. How about the movie, The Ten Commandments? How many people have a movie that, uh, as far as the human people, part of it goes, they're the deal. And Moses, God said, you know what, I, I trust my people, but Moses, I trust him with my whole house. And yet it wasn't for Moses to enter the promised land. He had a certain run and then he was going to step aside and hand off to somebody else. And that's really interesting because we say every so often that nobody's replaceable. I mean, and nobody's irreplaceable. Wait, what do we say? Nobody is irreplaceable. Indispensable. Because everybody is replaceable. And we lionize when things are over, okay? 20 years with Joe Paterno, the coach at Penn State. He took over at about 67 or something, right? Quite How many old. years? 30? 40? 30, 30, 30, 30. Oh, more. Or more. Mm -hmm. yeah. How many national champions in there? Oh, yeah, so many. Two. Two? Out of 40 years? Let's just limit it to 40. You mean out of 40 years? 38 years they didn't win the national championship? Wow. Ben Schwarzwald, the great coach of the Syracuse Orangemen, was there from 1949 to 1973. I was at the last game at Archibald Stadium. And in all those years, they won one. You know Michael Jordan, right? 
You, you hear people talk about the goat nowadays, G-O-A-T. Used to be the goat was the guy who you hung horns on. He cost a game. Now goat stands for greatest of all time. And so people discuss who's the goat, who's the greatest. And a lot of people think Michael Jordan. And I don't know if you saw this thing I posted this week on Facebook, but Michael Jordan said, guess what? I lost over 300 games in my career. 26 times I was called on to hit the last shot of the game that would win the game for us, and I missed. 26 times he missed the game-winning shot. I don't know how many he made. You watch the highlight reels on, on YouTube, and I mean, he was great. I don't know if he's the greatest of all time, but he was great. And you just see him making shot after shot and unbelievable play after unbelievable play, just a tremendous. But 26 times he took the shot that could win the game for them and missed. And uh, then he lists his other failures, uh, the, the uh, championship rings that he lost to one Larry Bird. And so, well, once again, you think back, Larry Zonka, the great fullback from Syracuse University, and uh, the all-time prototype fullback in the NFL, and watch the highlight reels. And after about 10, 12 plays, they show the same one again. Because a lot of Larry Zonka's career, he <coughs> smashed into a wall of purple people eaters and lost a yard, or lost a couple yards. Well, we see his Hall of Fame bust, and that's what we remember. Well, Moses was not a perfect man either because of that <coughs> last word there, man. Moses was as human as everybody else, as human as you and me. And the time came for him to pass his torch on, and he would have to pass it on to jo uh, Joshua. And the Lord would say, on this day, I'm going to start <coughs> building up Joshua's reputation. I'm going to start giving signs so that the world sees that Joshua now is carrying the torch. I imagine the nation of Israel spent a lot of time saying, this Joshua, he isn't like Moses. While when Moses was our leader, uh, we were part in Red Seas. I mean, we were getting manna from heaven. And they forget that when Moses was their leader, they were saying, <coughs> We curse you, Moses. You brought us out here to die. They did nothing but grumble and complain. The Bible says they went to their tents and complained. I love it. They went to their tents. Remember when I first entered the ministry and I thought we'd have a Sunday school meeting and the Sunday school meeting would take place and we'd discuss what we we're going to do and how it was going to be done. And everybody was in agreement until they walked out the door and got to their tents. And about three days later, nothing was working. Nothing was a good idea. I can't believe we were gonna, we're not gonna do this. This can't happen. This will ruin the church. Everything will fall apart. Because when, when they go to their tents and grumble, we go to our tents and, I, I, I don't do those kind of things, right, Beth? She can tell you I'm not the kind of a person to sit in the house and grumble and complain and say, did you hear what they said? Did you hear what he said? Did you hear what she said? I would never stoop so low as to do anything like that. Uh, it's my stock and trade. Right? That's who we are. Frankly, I believe that's what family's for. So you can open your heart up and share with a limited number of people boy, what you're really thinking and uh, and 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 Hopefully, no, it's not going to go to the rest of the world. It's not going to go to everybody. You know, God said we, we're not meant to be alone. Uh, we need to have somebody to be able to share with. Well, it's time for Moses to leave. And believe me, you know, like I said, I, I, I'm a, I could grumble with the best of them. But when I tell you that I love being here, and when I tell you I love being with you people, when I tell Audrey that I love Audrey Arthur, <laughs> I mean it. I mean every word of it.
and I mean it with a book from the bottom of my heart, I'll stand before the living God. Just like the Apostle Paul said, he said, you're my boast. He said to the Corinthians, who, again, were just giving him junk, grumbling. And I don't think we're a bunch of grumblers and complainers more than anybody else. I just think we're regular people here, really, what I frankly think. But anyways, all that said, Moses said, you know what, it's time for me to go. And Deuteronomy is basically his last instructions to the people of God. All through the book of Numbers, we read, and God spoke to Moses. And God spoke to Moses. And God said to Moses, but now this book starts, and Moses, these are the words Moses spoke to Israel. And I noticed something that, you know, when you read the Bible again, Joe Ritter is great for saying that every time you read the Bible, you see something different. And I've read the book of Deuteronomy, the introductory part of it, the beginning of it, many, many times just for this little vignette we're going through. But over the course of my career, I've read it many, many times. And you read certain things and you pass right over them and say, yeah, that's really interesting. And then you move on because, I don't know, you think, well, there's no sermon in there. But all of a sudden last week I thought, this is the second thing Moses tells the people. This ought to be pretty important. If you're giving somebody your last instructions, you know, my father, I remember when, I, when we went to, we, we left home. And I was going to go out to Newcastle and it was my first minute, you know, my first uh, real job so to speak, and Dad, one of his pieces of advice was, be frugal with your money, okay? It's pretty good advice, be frugal with your money. And uh, that's the thing that really sticks out in my mind. Well, I'm sure he said other things. Well, here's what Moses said. The Lord said, hey, it's time to move out. Time to leave Mount Sinai. You've got the law. Now move. And then in chapter 1, verse 9 through 12, which you have in your bulletin, it says, At that time I said to you, I'm unable to bear you. The Lord your God has multiplied you, so that today you're as numerous as the stars of the heaven. May the Lord, the God of your ancestors, increase you a thousand times more and bless you, as he has promised you. But how can I bear the heavy burden of your disputes all by myself? So Moses says, don't, don't be too worried about me leaving. Uh, I've never really been the whole show, whether you realize it or not. You might remember, Moses says, that back when we first left, we appointed leaders. Because my father-in-law came to me and he said, Moses, these people are going to wear you out. They're all bringing you the same, their problems every day. Everybody comes to Moses. Everybody comes to one man. And this whole nation, the size of Chicago, that's the size of the number of people who left the promise or left the nation of Israel and wandered through the wilderness. Chicago, they can't all bring you their issues, Moses. You'll never make it. And so he said, we need to appoint people. Because I just can't bear this heavy burden. Choose from each of your tribes individuals who have these characteristics, he says. Number one, they need to be wise. Number two, discerning. And number three, reputable. Wise. That's that Greek word, sophisticated. Sophia Loren, Loren's name was the wise Loren. Sophia, okay, that's Greek. Hakam, that's the normal Hebrew word for wisdom that you have all through the book of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom. I want you to appoint people who have the wisdom to fear the Lord, to know that this is all about Him and it's all, not all about you. You know why we enter the promised land? You know why these people entered the promised land? It wasn't because they were sin-free. 
It wasn't because every time God turned around, they were ahead of him, already doing his will. They, as we said, they were a bunch of grumblers. They went to their tents and grumbled. After they grumbled in their tents, they came and they, they called for mutiny more than once. And when they called for mutiny, they said, Moses, I can't believe you, you know, you brought it, Moses, I know what's in your head. This is all a plan by you to destroy us. You're doing the things you do intentionally to ruin us. And this God of yours, he's doing the same thing because your God hates us, they said. God must hate us or he wouldn't treat us the way he does. And I need people who've got the wisdom to look past that. I've got people who need to have the wisdom to say, now wait a minute. Do you really think God hates us? If he's brought us into this wilderness, and if he's really loving, compassionate, gracious, kind, slow to anger, if he's really the creator of this magnificent world that we live in, do you really think that he hates us? Is it possible, a wise person would say, that there's more to life than what we see? Is it possible that a God who creates everything can see more than the created people? Is it possible that the God who spoke all things into being knows that there's more to life than our three score and seven? or three score and ten, I should say. A wise person looks at things and steps back. A young person looks at things and falls apart. When we went to Newcastle, our first church, hadn't been there, I'm going to say, maybe a month and a half, two months, maybe. And I had gone to church down in Allentown. Ken Smith it was my pastor down there while I was in Bible college. And Elvin Murphy had been my pastor in Johnson City, both, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the best. I just loved them both. They were both great. And uh, Reverend Smith at the time was the secretary of the School of Theology. <coughs> he was still in, a student in school. And after a month or probably a month and a half, I called Reverend Smith and he says, how's things going there? And I said, it's not good. <coughs> well, what do you mean it's not good? Well. I was looking at the finances, and if the finances continue the way they're going, we're going to be broke in about a year and a half. And I said, you know what? And you know what happened when we first got to once in Bible school? One of my teachers, Dr. Ed Bean, said the first person you meet at the door is very often going to be the biggest headache in the whole church. <laughs> <laughs> and the first person we met at the door was there to help. Dinner the first day. Uh, come to my house after church, we'll come, and, and she had tips of advice for Beth, such as, uh, now, now, Mrs. Rupert, of course, you know, you'll be cooking on Saturday, because we keep the Sabbath in this church, and we don't believe in cooking on Sundays, so you'll be cooking on Saturdays, right? And Beth's like, hamana, hamana, hamana. <laughs> and then when they went, there was a ladies' meeting, the ladies went to Lenny Broke Markle's home. Lenora Broke Markle was her name. One of the nicest ladies ever walked the planet. And after that meeting, I came to get Beth, and one of the, the same lady met me on the sidewalk and said, uh, a reverend, <laughs> a, a, a reverend. And she started telling me how there was a book called The Myth Tree, and everybody in the church was up the myth tree. And all the characteristics of people who are in the myth tree Jealousy, uh, hard-heartedness, uh, stinginess, uh, backstabbing, backbiting. Uh, she was telling me about all the individuals of the church and how they were all up the myth tree. <laughs> and then one of the ladies was like, they were horror-stricken. And one of the ladies said a couple weeks later, they apologized for this. And I said, don't worry about that. I mean, I said, I, I kind of get it. Too scared to death, we believe it, I believed it all, you know. And of course, the more this person told me about the myth tree and who was up the myth tree, 
the more my mind started telling me, I think you're the one who's up the myth tree. I think you're the one who has all these issues. And because these people, they're not coming to tell me, oh, she's a nightmare. Oh, she's a disaster. Oh, watch out for her. Oh, look out for her. No, they were just coming and being nice to me. And I thought, mm, I, I kind of get the picture. But I told Reverend Smith and I said, there's a lot of dissension in the church. I, it's just not good. And I told him, I don't know what else. And then he said, well, first of all, Reverend Murphy said, or Reverend Smith said, don't worry, the church is not going to close in a week and a half. The church has been there for a very long, he was the voice of wisdom to young ears, to somebody who was young and enthusiastic and impressionable. And he said, don't worry, it's not, that church has been there a long time, it's not going to close in a couple of years. And he went through the different things and sort of just talked me through all these things. And it was so helpful because a lot of the things I had thought of in my own mind, but there's nothing like hearing a reasonable, wise, experienced person share their viewpoint to encourage you and help you. So Moses says, here's what we need to do. <clears throat> We're gonna pick leaders and they're gonna be over 50s and over, uh, Commanders of, you're going to have commanders of uh, thousands and commanders of hundreds, and then you're going to have commanders of fifties, and then you're going to have tens, and then you're going to have officials throughout your tribes. And it's all going to flow together. But we need people of wisdom. People don't hit the panic button as soon as something goes wrong. The next thing he says, we need people who are discerning. That word discerning is really interesting. The Greek translation is epistemos. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. It's the scientific study of how we know what we know. That's what philosophers call epistemology. But in our pur for our purposes here, understanding, gain insight. And it's interesting that a word that has really the same spelling, virtually, maybe different vowel, <coughs> means something like an interval or something between. And so somebody who is discerning is somebody who is able to distinguish between two things. A person who can tell the difference between why this is a good route and that's a poor route. And they don't have things jumbled, they're able to separate things. I'm, I'm, I'm astounded by the human lungs. How about the lungs? What do your lungs do? Your lungs, they ingest gas, which we know as air. And that air is a mixture of things, and the lungs pull in the air, and the lungs sort gas out. Can you sort gas out? Can you put three bins on your table and say, let's put the carbon in here, let's put the oxygen in here, and let's put the whatever else gas you want, helium over here, We'll put them in three containers and separate them. Well, we can't do that, can we? <laughs> Chopping up air with the knife. But the human lungs could pull out oxygen and say, you're going to the blood. And then the blood circulates it through the body and it brings energy and vitality. In fact, they call it then the life is, the blood is in the life, or the life is in the blood. And so it brings that vitality, that energy, that oxygen you need all through the body. And then the lungs say, wait a minute now, carbon, what do we got over here? Is that that carbon dioxide? So we'll send that back out. <clears throat> and we exhale. And we get rid of the carbon dioxide that we don't need, right? And the human lungs have that ability to distinguish between this and that. I watched these guys getting ready to tear down this building over here in Carbondale the other day, the old Scotch Motors slash Carbondale Ford, they're tearing that building down, believe it or not. And um, I watched the guy with his Kubota <coughs> bucket pluck this piece of metal up here, and set it over here, and pluck this sheet of metal over here, and set it over here. And it plucked this piece and set it there. 
and he made stacks and he separated and he distinguished between what was going to be recycled, what was going to be able to be reused maybe, what was going to go to a certain place. Well, that's what we need, Moses said. We need people who can make distinctions and understand when two people say, no, this is the same thing, they have to be able to look at it and say, no, it really isn't the same thing. And here's why, and there's the difference. That's wisdom. And that's what God said. I provided you with those things. And then he says we need reputable leaders. That's the word know, okay? To know something. But it's a reflexive idea. It's to be known by others. We want people who didn't just show up last week and we don't know anything about them. We do that in church sometimes. We don't do that in this church, really. But if somebody shows up immediately, often, oh, I'm so glad they're here because I don't want to have any more jobs in the church. I don't want to have to do anything else. Let's let, give it to them. And when I first came to Johnson City and I got saved and I've been in that church for probably a month and a half and I was on fire for the Lord. I was reading the Bible all the time. Loved it, couldn't get enough, and somebody said, it'd be a good idea to make him a Sunday school teacher. But it wasn't a good idea to make him a Sunday school teacher. Because my first volley in Sunday school was, you know, anybody who drinks is, uh, they're gonna, probably going to go to hell. <laughs> and immediately my student, who was probably eight or nine years old, said, my daddy drinks beer. <laughs> Thanks, Reverend. <laughs> I wasn't Reverend yet. Thanks, Alan. And all of a sudden it's like, humming, humming, humming. I guess this requires a little bit more thought than what I had. I thought the sum total of Christianity at the time, there was no doubt the Spirit of God came into my life. But <clears throat> coaching I was getting from certain areas was smoking, drinking, dancing, and swearing are the cardinal sins. Those are the things that will send you to hell. Those are the things that get you destroyed. And then you start reading your Bible and think, wait, wait a minute. What exactly are the cardinal sins? Those sound more like probably bad habits to me. Gluttony, we wouldn't talk about that. Uh, that, that that's kind of off the charts, especially in primitive <laughs> Methodism, and especially with well, certain people. But those don't sound like the Ten Commandments to me. I guess we're going to have to use a little bit more discretion here. I guess we're going to have to sort out what are bad habits and what are really sins. And when somebody says card playing is a sin, well, then I was raised in sin with my grandmother, who was as godly a woman as I've ever known, because we played gin rummy, or not gin rummy, it was rummy 500 all the time when we were kids. And I didn't realize that grandma and me were all going, and my brothers and sisters were all going to hell because we played those cards. <laughs> And then later on in life, Mrs. Beers, I thought, I ain't going to hell alone. And uh, she was shut in, and I was taking care of her, and I led her down the path to playing cards. I <laughs> play cards. We spend our time playing cards. Okay, great, I brought, I got a deck. We played Rummy. No, is that what we played? Yeah, I think we played Rummy. <coughs> and then you, I said, really, what's so evil about cards? I went on a vacation when I was still in Bible school, my first year, first half a year. We went to Chicago, my whole family. The family sat around getting ready for Thanksgiving. The night before Thanksgiving, Alan, we're gonna play, what were they gonna play? Pinocchio. Wanna play? No, I really don't wanna play. Oh, come on, we meet somebody else. No, I really don't want to. Why not? Come on, Alan, we'll show you how to do it. I can't because cards are of the devil. <laughs> And my family's like, what? <laughs> uh, these people were raised in church. They spent their whole time of life in church. And cards were the devil. But my father, he had some Methodist aunts from Brockport who would have thought that too, probably. And so he had heard something like that. But I tried to explain to them how the king stands for something wicked and evil. And the queen, and I wasn't even sure. I read the tract once that told me the cards were evil, and I was sure of it, and now all of a sudden I can't explain it. And I remember laying in bed that night thinking, boy, do you look stupid. <laughs> These Catholics here, and you're representing the primitive Methodist church. And you look like a dumbbell. So later on you learn to discern, to distinguish, and say, you know what? 
Those cards aren't the problem and the game's not the problem. Probably the problem is that a guy would leave his job on a Friday night, go out and get drunk, gamble away his paycheck, come home to his wife empty-handed, and she would associate the whole ball of wax with, I don't, get that we don't, I don't have food for the kids. I can't take care of the family because you're down there wasting it playing cards. And then somebody says, just get rid of cards altogether, and that's the solution to the problem, right? That really isn't, is it? <laughs> Jesus was able to distinguish, wasn't he? He said, no, nah, it's not the cards. And it's not even really the alcohol. It's the heart of man that's the problem. And you get the heart of man right, and then all these things will take their proper place. <laughs> and But if the heart of man is wrong, then adulteries and fornications and drunkenness and licentiousness and thefts and murders and all the evil things that take place on this earth, they proceed out of the heart of man. It has very little to do with that deck of uh, paper playing cards that don't mean anything like that. We had a lady come into our church one day in Newcastle. She said, uh, she came in, it was Christmas time, and she stood at the back of the sanctuary and she said, oh, what a shame. I says, what? And everybody was happy. She says, oh, you got that Christmas tree there. Yeah, I know. What was wrong with the Christmas tree? Well, I kind of had an idea where this was going. I read one of the tracks. <laughs> Christmas tree is a satanic representation. Ancient druids used to live in those trees, and they're really demon spirits. And so you're celebrating Satan and evil and the demon spirits by having that Christmas tree in your church. And I said, man, that doesn't mean any of that to me. All, all that Christmas tree means to me is it's Christmas time and everybody's happy and we're going to share presents and it's the birth of Christ. But she saw something completely different. And so Moses said, you know what? We need leaders that can make discerning and wise choices and people who have a reputation that we trust. That's why I'll tell you something right now. You look around here. You can't beat Sue Hendrickson for a music director. A person of integrity, a person who can make distinctions, a person who can listen to seven, seven to 14 people have an opinion and then sort it all out like the lungs and say, this is what we're gonna have to do. This is gonna be the best course of action. We're far, I think we cleared uh, $8,000 last year we, we take in about three thousand to five thousand to eight thousand dollars a year more than we take than we spend every year. Okay. The last time we didn't take in that much money was I don't know seven or eight years ago, and then before then was the same thing. We have a treasurer here. You know what her training is? Mary Beth went to school in Carbondale High School, and then she went to school so she could learn to uh, be a hairstylist. And after all that, she could take those books and handle them and does a great job and has discretion and has wisdom and somebody we trust. <coughs> Debbie Ritter, she likes to have fellowship. She wants to have fellowship. And so she just automatically say, what can we do? And she ends up with Debbie's Raiders, this, this ladies group here. And it's just because this, these are gifts God's given these people. And it's true across the board here in this church. Audrey's another one. I'm telling you what, uh, I've never been in a church that had a janitor as, as good as this one here. She puts in the time she intelligently knows what needs to be taken care of. I remember the first, I was janitor at Johnson City Church, mm -hmm. and I remember Al Garms telling me, hey, if you take care of the entryway first, that's the most important thing, because that's the first thing people see. Make a good first impression. Al Garms wasn't a highly educated person. He just had a brain. He just had some common sense. He just had some wisdom. And so they take care of the priority things and then work at the other things. And when people come and visit our church, 
It always looks nice. And it's up and down the line. Joyce over here, she's not the secretary of the church, okay? And she's sort of the, what would you call yourself, a guide? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Help she to a ship, let's see. Yeah. Makes sense quite Joyce nice. Albert has suggestions that could really get under your skin. <laughs> <laughs> happen to be very wise and intelligent <laughs> suggestions that make you look good, make me look good, and are deeply appreciated. Okay, that's the truth. And it's true across the board. We have that here. Well, you said to me, the plan you proposed is a good one. So I took the leaders of your tribes, wise and reputable individuals, and I installed them as leaders over you, commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, commanders of fifties, commanders throughout your tribes. And just let me read one little passage before we close. See, Moses wrote, just as the Lord my God has charged me, I now teach you. God told me these things, and now I'm telling you. Statutes and ordinances for you to observe in the land you're about to enter and occupy. You must observe them diligently, for this will show your wisdom and discernment. Do you want to be wise and discerning? Learn and obey God's <coughs> commands. Do you want to be young and foolish? Rework them. Twist them around. Ignore them. Make them fit your priorities and you will not be seen by real wise people and real discerning people. No, when they hear all these statutes, they're gonna say, you know what, this is a great nation and they're a wise and discerning people. They have an organization. There's order, it's not chaos. They're not just making it up as they go along. They're not just doing whatever they feel like. They've got a standard, a gold standard, delivered from heaven by God through his prophets. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your holy word. Because we live in a world that seems like it's wildly adrift. But in every pocket of people, in every area, we see there are wise and discerning people, people of wisdom, we see people who have made a reputation that would make them trustworthy. Our Heavenly Father, number one, we want this church to be full of people who are wise and discerning and trustworthy, not just in this church structure itself, but when they go home, to be wise and discerning at the kitchen table, to be persons of integrity down at work. The people they work with say, you know what? Uh, this, that, whatever, but you know what? You can count on this person. They're a person of integrity. They're a person of honor. They're a person of decency. They might not even know you have anything to do with church, but they just see the way you behave and say, you know what? Uh, they got it going. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, we want to be those kind of people all over the world. Would you speak to us about this? That we might embrace Jesus Christ in his teaching and let it speak and let it be our guide instead of reworking him into our own image which we see all too often and it can't but lead to hurt it can't but lead to chaos it can't but lead to failure but through success in the long run will find its way to wisdom discretion and a reputation that has been built over a period of time. Speak to us in Jesus' name, and we'll thank you forever. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, turn in your hymnals, if you would, to 315. 318? Yeah, that's what I said, right? 318. Don't listen to what I say, listen to what I think. Standing as we sing, 318.
you speak to us about these things? Would you help us to recommit ourselves to walking in your light? Not conforming you to our will, but conforming our will to yours. And we will find strength, stability, order, consistent success. But if we were to neglect those things, you'll find chaos, disappointment, and hurt, and pain, and frustration, and lostness. Speak to us, Father, about bringing light into a world that needs it too much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.